Hi, I'm Lori Wirth. I'm a medical oncologist and I practice in Boston, Massachusetts. Today I'm going to talk about head and neck cancer and how medical oncologists can be involved in the care of people living with this diagnosis. I'm a medical oncologist and I specialize in taking care of people with head and neck cancer. When we take care of people with head and neck cancer, we really have a large multidisciplinary team. So uh, we take care of people together with surgeons, radiation oncologists, dietitians, speech and language pathologists, but as the medical oncologist on the team, I'm the one who gives patients drugs to help treat their cancer. So we give people IV chemotherapy and we give newer drugs as well, immunotherapy, oral drugs to help treat their cancer. So medical oncologists are the people on the team who give people systemic therapy to treat their cancer. Typically when I'm meet people with head and neck cancer, they have already had their diagnosis but have just gotten their diagnosis. So we often see people together in a multidisciplinary new patient clinic where we're seeing people with uh, a surgeon, a radiation oncologist, and other team members. And we're usually the next stop after people have had a, a biopsy that shows they have a new diagnosis of head and neck cancer. And then we, then we kind of take it from there. The role of the multidisciplinary practice in taking care of people with head and neck cancer really is quite complex. Um, and one thing that my patients ask me all the time is, who's the quarterback here? Um, and I think what I usually say is, uh, well, I'd like to think I'm the quarterback, but actually we really do, uh, you, have, you have several quarterbacks. Um, uh, so, I'm very fortunate to work in a group that's worked together for a very long time, and we really know um, each other very well. In our institution, um, our particular practice is one where patients are lucky to have a number of, of quarterbacks on their team. Our, our patients also um, need to have dietitians who can help get in nutrition because eating and drinking is, can be significantly affected by the cancer and the treatment. So almost all of our patients have swallow therapists who work with them. We have nurse practitioners, practice nurses, infusion room nurses, nurses in radiation oncology, PAs in the, in the surgical department, uh, technicians down in radiation oncology. So it's a team of people um, who are all really kind of working together and pulling for uh, the, the patient in front of us to get them through uh, treatment as best as possible. And then recover as well as possible as well. In smaller community settings. Uh, there aren't um, uh, medical on oncologists or radiation oncologists who only specialize in taking care of people with head and neck cancer. But that's okay because we really support the network of referring physicians um, as much as, as we can. The first visit that we have with people with a new diagnosis of head and neck cancer is a really long, intense visit where we ask a lot of questions, we do a very careful physical examination, we look at a lot of data, and then we spend a lot of time talking. Um, I think for our, our new patients, it can be um, a whopper of a visit and really kind of overwhelming, probably a little bit of information overload. We tend to walk people through their their um, the process of starting their treatment as they're initiating treatment and going through it. For many of our patients who are newly diagnosed with head and neck cancer, um, they might be seeing us weekly in clinic after they've finished all of their diagnostic workup, all of their CT scans, biopsies, blood tests, maybe MRIs and other studies. Then we initiate therapy. Many people with a new diagnosis of head and neck cancer will get treated with radiation and chemotherapy together. That can last uh, for a couple of months. And we usually see people during that period of, of being on treatment once a week. So I have the pleasure of really getting to know my patients and their family members very well. And I have to say that's one of the most gratifying things about the job that I do.
people ask me all the time, what can I do to get ready? Uh, so I used to say, oh, don't worry about it. We'll do everything. And then, and then I realized I really need to come up with a better answer than that. <laughs> and I don't know that I have good answers, but but uh, one thing that, that is a challenge is getting in enough nutrition, being able to um, get through treatment without needing a feeding tube, hopefully. I think really in, in terms of nutrition in, and, and so forth, um, one of the things that I like to tell people is, you know, the pleasure of food is going to go away. It'll come back, but it'll take a long time to come back. So just enjoy your favorite food for, for right now. It's perfectly fine to enjoy a couple of hot fudge sundaes between now and, and when you can't enjoy them any longer, um, or steak, or your favorite food, enjoy it while you can, because that enjoyment's going to go away, and we don't realize how important just those simple pleasures of life are until we don't until we can't enjoy them any longer. Um, but also, uh, good nutrition is important in terms of the building blocks to get through treatment and to heal up. And uh, so a focus on good nutrition and other good healthy habits um, only makes sense and only helps people be stronger. Suddenly, you know, going to the gym and developing a good workout routine um, is not necessarily going to make or break uh, uh, being ready for treatment. Taking advantage of a little bit of downtime, uh, perhaps to uh, take nice long walks with your family and friends, um, uh, is good exercise. It gets you out of out of the house and out of the headspace, perhaps, of of dealing with this new diagnosis and just enjoying the simple pleasures of the world around us and and our family and friends um, can really make a big difference. And the other thing is about family and friends. They're worried as much as the person who has the new diagnosis is worried. And so it's an incredibly stressful time for the whole unit. Um, and for people to just give themselves a little bit of downtime to be with each other and a little bit of time to talk about what's going on can really make a big difference. To me, Made of More really is about taking care of the whole person uh, I often think about my job as making sure that their kidney function is okay, that their counts are okay, that their nausea and vomiting is well controlled, that their pain is well controlled. I've got my mental checklist that I go through in each clinic visit, but there's so much more uh, to our patients and their family and their loved ones than my checklist. and. We might spend 90% of the time going through the checklist of critical things that we need to cover with each visit. But really in the end, it comes down to taking care of the person that's there, providing them with the best care, and anything that we can do to help our patients' lives be as good as possible and be as meaningful as possible is really you know, what our jobs are all about. If you or someone you love are diagnosed with head and neck cancer, remember you are not alone. Together, we are made of more.